good evening. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. And thank you very much for coming out on Rise Day. Um, I'm Jane Lee. I'm a Rotary Council member in November. Um, the Rise Day, there are so many of you here. It's, uh, I'm really pleased that uh, when we, we're coming to you against uh, certain firework parties that happen to be tonight. So, please, if you've given us a the fact that you come to be seen today and the fact that what is much more important is that you will ask us questions because it's from the questions that you ask us one I hope that you will learn but much more importantly that we will learn about where some of our communication is maybe not particularly working because you're asking us questions that I think maybe in the past I think you should know the answer so it's my fault that you don't know the answer but very important that, that you remember that I am the police and crime commissioner of your police service. It's not my police service, it's not the chief constables, it's not John Riley's, who's the area commander of the police in a minute. It is very much yours. We are spending your money. So it's really important that we hear your views about how we are going to spend your money. So I'm going to speak to you for a, a few moments about what I've done over the last few years and what my intention is to, is to do. And then John Riley, who is the area commander of Bristol, will then, will then um, talk to you for a, a small time period. And then it's very much up to you to ask us questions. And, to, and one of the points of today is for you to ask us any questions. There's no censorship. Uh, if you ask us something that's very specific, the chances are that John nor any of the other officers may well know that answer, but we guarantee we will get back to you with an answer. So uh, make it as wide as you want, as narrow as you want, but we are here to be able to answer, answer you. So I'm delighted to be, to be, to be here today. I mean, I've seen a, a busy, busy week. I was at the Hayden Watch Network conference uh, a couple of weekends ago. And I was also invited to speak at the Bristol Mental Health Equality and Diversity event. Um, and so it's important that I go out, but it's, it's far more important that I go out and I listen. You know, we are all very good, and you know, here am I saying that I'm going to listen, and what am I doing? I'm talking. So, uh, we need to always remember that I'm only good at police and crime commissioner as the stuff you tell me. If you don't tell me, I promise you I can't do anything about it. If you don't tell the police, I guarantee they won't do anything about it. You need to be able to come and feel confident in talking to me and being able to talk to, to the police agent. But let me just tell you, I've been now in this job for nearly three years. I was elected in November 2012. Um, I've never stood before anything in my life before. Um, I, my history, for those of you who know, who've been around the business in Bristol, as I have, uh, I was part of a bakery business that we ran, we, we, um, we started, I think, my great grandfather started in 1910, and I was fifth generation. Uh, so as part of a bakery business, I was part of the Christian um, Monitoring Board at Bristol um, Prison. I've been a magistrate for 15 years uh, on the Family, Adult and Youth Bench. Um, and so you can see I have a real interest in the criminal justice system. But what I was really clear that when this job, and I just, I felt that going for an election was actually a very common thing to do. Uh, where everyone can ask questions and I would be interrogated by many of you. Um, and I think the, the, the real point is that I decided to stand as independent because I was determined to offer the electorate the choice of not being a party politician. Policing is a really complex business. It is um, it's 24 7 and it has a lot of complexities. But until you're actually getting quite close to it, you don't quite understand the complexity. Uh, and the last thing I think that um, I thought the police and commissioner should ever be is, is a party politician. Um, I didn't want anyone from Whitehall pulling my strings. The only person that pulls my strings is you, the rest of the state in some sense. And uh, so that's why I decided to stand. Luckily, there were enough people who agreed that the 
did want to uh, appoint such a sadly here, and we had a 19.5% uh, um, but turnout, so which was the largest in the middle world, and I got uh, a simple number of votes, 125,000 people voted for me for the second time. So you can see that there was a very clear message coming from the public that they didn't want this role to be a, 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 a politician. And let's also be very honest, you weren't voting for me, most of you didn't even know who I was. You were being asked to vote for someone you didn't know, to a job that none of us understood, at a time of the year when none of us voted. Uh, and for many, it was the, the first time you knew you were going to vote for when you got a polling card through your door. Um, I suspect it may be similar next time round, um, because once again, the government said that they won't uh, fund a mail shop. And you can see that no candidate, well, I don't think there'll be any candidates who can afford to uh, send a mail shop to, to 1.6 million people in Aiden Somerset. So Aiden Somerset patch covers 16 parliamentary constituencies. So you can see it's, it's an enormous, enormous patch. Um, and I think that it will be interesting just to see how much comment from the media there is about the, the next election. So am I expecting a great turnout next year? No, I don't think I probably am. Uh, I think if you look at the facts that policing is not at the top of anyone's radar, it's obviously my top of my radar, I know it's top of John's radar. But generally speaking, if you look at the general election, where was policing discussed? We talked about the NHS, we talked about immigration, we talked about the economy. No one talked about the police. And to be absolutely fair, it didn't really matter who got in. The Labour and the Tories were both going to cut the, um, the, the funding for police. And that is something that is, 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 is certainly exercising a lot of my time at the moment. Um, George Osborne has said that because we are not a ring fence department, as you know, the NHS is ring fence. We are not very close, and so we have, to, we have to look at the potential of cuts, 25 or 40 percent cuts in our funding that will be announced in November. So that is a really going to make a really big impact in what policing, what policing looks like, and what we can do um, within those constraints. Because if I if I if I if I looked at it just as um, the money that we've got to save, we will, we will, we, we are looking at something like between 39 million and up to 64 million pounds. We are going to have to save over the next few years. Now we are already smaller than we were in 2010. In 2010, the Aiden Somerset Constabulary had about 3,200 officers. We are now 2,700. So we've lost 500 officers in the last few years. So the cuts that are going to come out that go to be announced in end of November, we could be looking at uh, 600, 700 plus officers a day. So while I'm very keen to listen to your questions, please always reflect that we are not going to be able to put more bots in the We're not going to be able to do some of the things that I would love to do, and I know that the Constabulary would love to do. But we have to look after our most vulnerable. We have to concentrate on looking at threat risk and harm and looking at our most vulnerable. So maybe there will come a day that maybe we're there already. But if I lose my phone, or my phone gets stolen, if it's a pain in the neck to me, it's, it's inconvenient. But maybe when someone who is elderly or got learning difficulties, who is vulnerable, persistently, persistently targeted, uh, or intimidated, it's those police happen to look after and support. And those, that is where we are going to have to choose priorities. And I want to be very public, I want to be very honest with the public, and say this is how we are going to have to do things differently. Um, as you can see, I'm not a politician, and I could just sort of um, uh, you know, continue to give you very bland, bland comments about we're going to do all the same, we can always do more with less, etc, etc. But, I've never lied to the public, I'm not understand that. Uh, it's not a position we want to be in, but that is occupying an enormous amount of my time and with the Constabulary that we're going to do. In fact, last
last night we went to, uh, I went up to Wellington to see our local MPs um, to actually tell them, not make any part of this point, actually explain to them in detail what does 25% look like, what does 40% look like, and so that when they make their decision about whether they go to class the uh, spending review, that they know and they understand what it's like. And I do believe that there are politicians of every colour who have actually put their head in the sand that they don't want to make. So that is, that is, um, that is my, that is my view. So we are going to have a small workforce, we are going to have you know, less officers, and we are going to have to look at doing ways more efficiently. We're going to have to look at uh, making sure that we have the technology that you see doing business. That's the part of the Exactly, I think you see that, but I couldn't tell you that I'm in the difference, so there we go. We are going to have to make sure we have the technology that works. We have to make sure that our officers don't go back to police stations. If you think about it, if, if you're in a police station, you're not being visible. We need to make sure that what we've got, <laughs> we're going to be small, what we've got, we make it as visible as possible and we make it as accessible as possible. It's your police service, but we are going to have to do things differently. I'm also responsible for commissioning community safety services. So in the fourth coming in, well, Bristol has received £224,000 on community safety funding. I'm delighted that the is here from the state of Bristol. Um, because what we've got to do is work very, very much more closely together with all the local authorities, with our various agencies. What we mustn't do, and it's very easy, but everyone is, 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 is having fun, and it would be very easy to move the monkey off John's shoulder onto someone else's and say, that's not, that, I, you know, that's not one of our four things we have to do. But actually what we've got to do is merge our budgets, work together, and actually solve problems. Don't just let them move things around. I think if we do, we will be, we will be letting down, or we will be letting down our most vulnerable. And it's our most vulnerable that will be affected by these cuts, let's be very clear. It will be those that all organisations will start to attract, it will be very easy to, um, to, uh, to move away from this problem solving. And I'm really keen on to build with um, the other authorities and with all the agencies that how we can solve the problem. And I'm here also to connect your views with the police. I'm not using high pressure, and your views are really important. And why I think PCCs work, and I would say this one night, I am one, is that I replace a committee, and I'm not a committee, of the police authority, and Mike was on the committee, uh, and there was 17 of us. And we were relatively invisible. No one knew much about the um, police authority. Um, and so what's really clear to me now is that the police authority had in there last year about 200 to 250 people who contacted them. Since I've been in place, I've had over 12,000. Now many people say, I bet they're all complaints. And they're not. But what they are is people wanting to give feedback to improve their police service. They're not after litigation, they're not after compensation, they don't want someone sacked. They just want to say, this happened to me, I want you to make it better. I want you to make it so it doesn't happen to someone else. And I think that's one of the real values of having someone very identifiable. Now, of course, there's no signs that I can't go around saying to now without someone accosting me with um, some of their issues. But generally speaking, it's really important that there is one person to, to write to. Um, it's important that I listen to quiet voices. So I spend uh, one day a week out in the community listening to those people who, are not, who do not know how to not like people like me whether that's people who are homeless, whether that's people who are uh, <coughs> struggling with substance abuse, all those people who may come into contact with the police about how, how, how the police interact with them. Really important for me to do that. So, I mean, tomorrow I'm, uh, I, I, I'm out about with, uh, I'm going to Bristol Road Community Trust, I'm also going to Bristol Prison, um, I'm also doing a a pride award in order to, um, with someone who, who's been on a bobby van, um, helping vulnerable people to stay safe. This is a, it's a service for those who are vulnerable, who've been furthered or suffering from um, domestic violence, where uh, we have a, a number of bobby vans that can go out and make their own 
small and secure. So tomorrow we'll be celebrating with someone who's done it over 15 years. I'm also responsible for making a piece of crime plan. So one of the things that uh, when I came to post, we had one piece of crime plan to hold in Somerset. It's very clear to me that policing is different in different parts of, of, of our patch. So it's a different type of policing that happens maybe in the middle of uh, Bristol as opposed to Exxon. Two thirds of Exxon is in our patch, just for someone who, you know, just a bit to check that we're just not an, an urban police service. We have a big, big part in, 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 in the rural, rural areas. And we really launched the use of Mind Plan, which we have here. Um, and um, things like I campaigned on at the very beginning, we have we have made sure that these are priorities for the police, so that's tackling antisocial behaviour, burglary, domestic and sexual violence, putting victims at the heart of everything we do. And since we launched the police in front of that, one of the things that I've heard very clearly from, from local communities is that road safety needs to be an additional big priority. So I was always very keen to on adding priorities, you know, if people have a priority, actually you start sort of going down. But it was very clear that road safety which can mean different things to different people was really important. Whether that's speeding through villages, whether that's cyclists on pavements, whether that's cyclists going through red lights, whether that is people using their mobile phones or whatever. I think it's a whole raft of things, but it was very clear that that was that affected people's daily lives in, in, in the community. So we're making sure that it's evidence led or whatever the police are doing, making sure that we have some practical approaches, making sure that we support um, community sleep watch, and making sure that people feel that either through community sleep watch or neighborhood watch or PACs, that we make our communities as robust as we possibly can. We need to look after each other. The bad guys don't tackle robust communities. They find out vulnerable ones, they find out vulnerable communities, and that's where they will go because there are rich things there, let's be honest. So the more that we can do, the more that we can, with against the backdrop of, of, of the savings we've got to find, is that we've got to go and do a lot of early intervention and, and give some of our young people, encourage them to make wise choices, making sure that they understand that there is some choice. Some of our some of our, our young people don't even, you know. Sometimes they have moves on, may, may not be, uh, you know, be surrounded by great role models. And so we need to encourage them to make some real choices so that they don't choose to go into gangs, they don't choose to go down the slippery slope of maybe starting with doing some, some, um, some shoplifting. And then once they have the label of being a young criminal, it's very easy to think actually it's easier to stay as being a criminal rather than. Um, going back on the narrow. But we do need, we do need our active citizens, we do need our communities to, to, to work together, to work with the police. Um, and I think that we are incredibly lucky to have an, an amazing number of volunteers who work really hard. And one of the things uh, I've got is this um, 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 pride award, where people who can nominate what I call the silent stars in their community. The, the ones that, whenever you want anything done, they put their hands up when the, when the rest of us all sort of look to our, to our feet and then they're walking on us. These are the people who constantly keep our communities robust. And I think you, you may well know, know, know them, and if you know of any, then please nominate them for a rather nice public pat on the back and to say thank you. They're not very good at saying thank you, and I think we, we should do better. Um, just briefly, we are looking to go into a collaboration with Wiltshire where we can save the game some, some money, some um, significant uh, savings, and also to look at whether we can uh, eventually be working far more with our regional, our regional um, forces. So that's Devon, Dorset, Wiltshire, and Northshire. When we have a government that is, any government, that is going to make us smaller workforce, we have to see, we can't keep making us smaller and smaller and smaller and become more inefficient. So, I believe, this is a very personal view, I believe that within a period of time, and that could be five years, ten years or whatever, that we will be able to reach your course, that we will be sharing a lot of our back office stuff, we will be sharing specialist teams, but we will be ensuring that local neighbourhood 
fully subdued. It's what it's what it's all being protected as much as we can because that's how we police like consent. Having relationships with officers and local communities is how we continue to have that, that trust. But all the other stuff, we have to be honest, we have to find ways of being more and more efficient. I believe the only way we're going to be efficient is by being a regional force. Before I finish, I just want to mention the other things in the room, because I'm sure some of you may ask some questions about the garden. Um, I appointed the garden to which you come for in back in 2013 following an extremely rigorous process involving a panel of three independent members and various selection processes, including taking up very detailed references. Um, after the reports of serious wrongdoing, I referred the issues, as I have to, to the Independent Police Complaints Commission and decided to carry out an independent youth investigation. In July of this year, an independent panel found that the government committed eight individual instances of misconduct and recommended eight final written warnings. Following that announcement, there was a very extensive reaction within the force at all levels, I mean at all levels, at senior officers, superintendents, association, federation and youths and members of the public, that they did not feel they did not feel that they had confidence in the military institute. I listened to those views, especially those of officers and staff, and decided to use a procedure which is, which is called the Section 38, um, which I, I initiated, and part of that was that I uh, had to consult with Sir Tom Windsor, who is the Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Constabulary. I did this, he carefully considered all the evidence and supported my decision to initiate this process. In his replies, Thomas stated that I was in an invidious position and in his view, the approach I've taken is appropriate in these circumstances. On Friday, October 16th, I accepted Nick Gardner's resignation with immediate effect. So at the moment, we have temporary Chief Constable Gareth Long, who will continue to lead the constabulary while the recruitment process is, is taking place. So I just thought I'd do that bit so that in case you were to go to ask questions so that I was doing uh, I could just clear the open now. I think one of the important things as a police for high commissioner, which I've already said, is that is listening. And I go out, I, I go out in public forums, I do surgeries, I sit in supermarkets, I, I make myself as accessible as I can. Um, and, and I hope that some of the questions you will be asking me will give me a clear direction of where you want the police service to be in the next few months. So if you have been, thank you for listening, and we're now going to listen to John with the youth and more local about that. Thank you, Sue. I'm not going to the next time I'm going to ask you, I'm going to stand here if that's okay. Um, and really to start, I'm going to say thank you to all of you for coming. I probably just reiterate a little bit what Sue said. It's vitally important for people that want to be interested in understanding what's happening in policing in the city. And to use a quote from Robert Lee, policing is far too important to be left to the police alone. So I'm very grateful that you're here. I think it's really important, it's very important that you share your views, because I'm actually here to listen to them to understand what you want from policing. Now, Sue said I'm too superintendent for the right I'm here at command of Bristol, which means I'm responsible services across the city. Um, I've been in post nearly two years, but the all my 18 year service with Aiden Somerset has been in Bristol in both new form and detective roles. Um, I came to the city for nearly 25 years ago to study, and I'd like to so much to stay. I still live here with my family, and so I've done a lot of professional and a personal investment to make sure the city is the right place to live. And I'm sure you'll agree that it's a fantastic city. Um, it's an interesting place. It's the sixth largest city in England. It's the second most diverse city outside of London, and it's a fact that probably many of you know that there's 91 languages that we go to school. There's 50 countries of birth. In addition, it's the funny city of the haves and the have nots, which makes it quite a challenging police environment in which to work. Now, this evening, I want to talk about what we're trying to achieve and explain to you what you can expect from us. I know she's spoken quite clearly around the way, but there is some expectations I think we can have in the local policing. Now, like any large urban area, Bristol is very busy. There's lots of demand space upon us, not all of them are crime related. But just to give you a bit of an overview, I want to kind of show you the day in the life of urban urban policing. And I'm sure my colleagues down the front end agree with me. This just represents kind of an average day, but that doesn't take into account for the police in football or if there's a protest. We're talking about 400 incidents according to our call centre requesting police attendance in the city. That's not interaction in the front office, that's not phone calls in asking to speak to somebody or interaction on the street with a local officer. So over 400 incidents, 115 reported crimes. I think interestingly, we can say for a city that almost 
outside the parking lot, six or eight burglaries. Ten missing people, 25 arrests, 49 reports of antisocial behaviour, 25 reports of domestic abuse, probably half of those criminal matters. But this is the demand that comes to us every day. We're not just a reactive police service, we're actually more than proactive in some ways as well. So, actually, what do we want you to achieve? What do we want to achieve for the city? I think the best place to start with that is what we look at the mission and vision of the staff, which is equally applicable to Bristol as well. So, we've got a mission and a vision. And the mission is to make the communities of Bristol safe and feel safe. And the mission is for the communities of Bristol have a high level of confidence in our delivery of police and services. I'm simply a shelter chap, so simply for me that means reducing crime and increasing confidence. So the next question is, what do we have to do to achieve that? And again, I come back to the public, we listen to you, we ask the public, what do you want to do, what do you expect from us? And we've called that together, what we call our service crimes. And <coughs> in, the blue, in the blue bubble you can see what the public has told us, what matters to you. And we've translated that into what the public can expect from us. Now, I'm just going to say you should have a but I'll tell you how to you. We respond to your request for service in the right way. You have access to any of the police services 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We will treat you professionally with fairness and respect. We will listen to ensure the tackle issues that matter most to you. We will endeavour to prevent crime and protect you from criminals. And we will keep you informed and updated. Three, sorry, six quite straightforward statements there. Clearly define what you can expect, what you the public can expect from us, please. Like it also answers the fundamental purpose of what we're here to deliver. My staff know this, I'm sure they're not their heads now, I've been through that with all of them. That's what I want to do now, just take a few minutes to just touch on each of those statements and explain how this is working in practice in the city. So firstly, we respond to your request for service in the right way, and you have access to this service 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. It's vital that we're here when we need this, particularly in light of the relationship that's been spoken about. And because of that, we redesigned where we operate, we've got a new operating model, which, is, which is changing is making it better for the public, simpler for our staff and better for the organisation. And with that new operating model, we've put, pulled together our response officers and our neighbourhood officers into one local policing team to increase the visibility of officers on the street and also we change our shift plans to make sure the right people, the right skills and experience are available at the right time when the public knows we need this. I mean, this is two touch on it, around privatisation using a threat harm risk matrix. Rather than simply looking at the increasing it, it's simply a crime type. So as an example, we look at individual circumstances. So if a victim is particularly vulnerable, or a offender is someone who is manned by us, and I'll come on to that in a minute, um, it may be that it's investigated by a specialist team rather by the local police. Whereas previously you might have said, well, if it's a specific crime type, it goes to this department. And if it's far more holistically looking at the individual need. We've also introduced a new call script in our comms centre we can do call them can quickly and easily assess what the need is and dispatch the right to the right unit in the right way at the right time. And finally, our service card limits is the first interaction through our website to ensure you get more information, much more user friendly, as well as the first point of contact and where you can also report crime to us. So moving on, we will listen <coughs> to ensure the exact issues that matter most to you. But we don't presume we know what's best. So we're absolutely here to listen. And there are many ways to get involved in shaping local policing. I mean, one of which is coming out this evening and speaking to us. I think there's other opportunities. Yeah, neighborhood forums, neighborhood watch, big surgeries. These are all advertising your communities and on our website. And there's a real opportunity to get involved and tell us what's happening. I mean, as an example, last month, um, a, a long-term investigation came to conclusions and calls, but the community there said they actually felt the drug team was taking place on the streets. Um, that was raised in April 4, and that was something the community was saying to us. So we had a lengthy investigation, which culminated last month, there were 50 people being arrested in an army who were concerned with supply and control drugs in the city. Now that's had a significant impact on the people's lives and people's supports. So it's really what we do this year, we do all to, to work with them. Out. The PCC, as you explained, also set some priorities for us across the city. Tagging ASV, domestic and sexual violence, burglary, and criminal road safety, and also putting the victim first. And then we have long term plans for that. But again, just last week, Halloween in South Bristol, which consistently been involved with antisocial behaviour, we did some really targeted work with the fire services and young people just to make sure they knew the 
this project is also the you know, reaction plan for it. Is there a real drop in ASD on the 31st last month? There's some really good work that's ongoing in the city. Slightly serves as something else that's been raised by the community, concerning the way the power is used. And on the back of that, I, I need to start the search for the force. In which if you train for officers, but we've got the community to come in and see what's happening. Uh, we've also commissioned a bill to, to really get officers to understand what's the impact of the search of our community. We've also issued scrutiny panels where the community, members of the public, come into the police station, have a look at our sort of search record to tell us, you know, is that proportion, is that reasonable, is that what we expect from the police service? And we've now started to roll out 21 video cameras that officers are wearing, but I don't know if I've got one on it's been done in a random way, so I don't think it's due to where I'm not. It's to do a pilot at sea. We're recording all sorts of searches again, and then we're looking at that interaction between the officer and the other party. And finally, also, I want to highlight a really fantastic independent advisory group, which um, calls together many diverse community members from across the city to assist us in understanding the needs of many different communities and help us again share policing services. So I appreciate you coming to this evening, but again, there's plenty of ways you can assist me. Uh, coming out of the forum, volunteering to come on to the independent advisory group, being involved in the stop and search group panel, to the bottom of the speaking to the if you're interested in taking that call. It's absolutely vital to be listening to all the services. Right, we've attempted to prevent crime and protect you from criminals. So, living, I suppose, is a very simple question about reducing crime and increasing confidence, but well, how will we address it? What are the crime trends looking like? Right, this is crime trends. This is totally called the crime for Bristol over the last 10 years. You can really see that. You can clearly see a downward trend. In fact, it's over 40% in that 10 year period of reduction of crime. You see it starts to plateau. In fact, it started to increase slightly at the other end. Um, so, what the, what the crime survey in England well is that the crime is still falling. The hard core of crime is just that it's starting to increase slightly now. We put that down to better reporting practices. But also an increase in the reporting in really difficult areas previously, having an areas of domestic abuse, sexual violence, and modern slavery. So actually, we've seen that as a, a really positive kind of indicator of trust and increased trust and confidence. So, what was previously reluctant to do the voice of the crowd would speak to us. And I'm telling you about crimes that were happening. Obviously, we can now intervene with support and bring friends to justice. So that's a really positive, positive story. Now, again, large reductions are in part due to. The re nationally recognised offender management schemes we run both across the board, but primarily in Bristol, they started off. But we target resources to those people that are committing the most amounts of crime in a way to try and find pathways in how to their criminal behaviour. Now that's extended to both prolific and dangerous offenders of the city. And, and as Sue said, crime prevention or is it just about um is it just about diversity, is it just about preventing <coughs> those already in the system? This is about early intervention, particularly for young people. I'm also chair of the defending team uh, for the city, which is vital for the time that young people come into the criminal justice system. There's a couple of things that there's a number of schemes in the UK, and a couple of things that I'm One is the door schemes, which is a uh, system sort of funded by a charity, the Catch 22, where we identify young people city wide who are at risk of becoming involved in criminality or antisocial behaviour. You divert them away from that kind of mentoring opportunities for sport, music, all sorts of different things. So it's funded externally. A fantastic way of seeing young people move away from possibly they may end up getting crime. And secondly, the neighbourhood policing teams are very much now engaged with the Think Banning program across the city, which is a local authority initiative funded by the central government, but we think those families have the highest level of demand for public services across the city. So again, working really closely with the Think Banning program. Many officers are working with families with their young people that come to the US. Really, really important work. Right. We will keep you informed and updated. And there's two parts to this. There's one part which is around letting you know what's going on across the city, informing everybody about police activity. And the second bit is probably if you're unfortunately you know, a victim of crime and social behaviour, what that means about updating you about what's happening. I think actually we're really good at the second part of updating victims. The first part, we're not going to do that. Actually, it's quite difficult. We saw in the first half, prison sports coming in every day, you know, really busy day to day, getting to the busy days and all But as we start to embrace technology, some of us have, that's what I mean. But um, we start to use Twitter more, we start to use Facebook more, we start to use our website, we're getting those messages out there. In addition, we're introducing new community alert systems and neighborhood watch, replacing the old wind master system, just to make sure that the message is getting out to the community. And we have got a lot of traditional messaging. We still do 
exit, and I refer to the St. Paul's emission of their own drug team. There's a massive leaflet drop in the year as well. So after they first started what was happening, they knew actually that these are listening and they're taking action. Secondly, it's around victim contact and making sure victims are getting regular and meaningful updates from officers in the case. And I've got your emphasis on this in my story. Lighthouse, so we stood for the last month, has done a fantastic job um, in looking after our more vulnerable victims, but they don't cover all our victims. So it's important that all police officers are investigating by understanding that. And you know, we've rolled out mobile devices now for all officers, so the members of the public can contact them directly um, while going to go through the control centre. But it's not just about how ready it is, it's about the meaning of this event. And we're trying to use all sorts of different so, you know, this is such a rather email or a text rather than a personal contact, and we're listening to that as well. Right. Right, finally, we will treat you professionally with fairness and respect. I think this, this, this is absolutely fundamental if we want to achieve the service promise. And the service promise talks about what we're looking to do, and this is how we're going to do it. And actually, it's got to be at the heart of all these interactions. Now I know that's not always the case that we do that, my staff always do that. And that's why I've got the feedback from the audience. I need to know when things aren't working. And these sort of forms will be great opportunities to know that. But we do seek feedback from victims of crime and from victims of antisocial behaviour. I mentioned we do have scrutiny panels to stop and search. And we have had insurance visits and inspections from the PCC's office to look at the quality of the work around the table. But I've got to be more proactive in understanding how we are doing. I mentioned the volleyball cameras. I think the introduction of those will really help us to review how our officers are interacting with the public. As so they've rolled out 120 across the city at the moment, and they're just recording stop and search and domestic abuse encounters. So we're going to do that every officer will be a group one, absolutely recording every interaction. Obviously, if you think about how you might sort of have to scale the, the jobs that we go through every day, if you sort of multiply that out in the amount of data that you can store, that's, that's why we have to follow this out very carefully to make sure we store them as appropriate. The biggest part of this section I'm treating professionally with fairness and respect for me is that living in false values. I'm going to really be proud of this. They're four simple, they're very powerful statements. And as, as my brother testified, if you get any one station in the city, you will see them very well displayed and all of my staff know them. And our values are public first, quality counts, today's business today, professional, friendly, and interested. And why do make these the foundation for policing in the city? And they're vital in order to achieve our vision and increase trust and confidence. I would be the first, I want you to be really proud of the men and women who are so committed to serving you every day. All of us at the team should be supported, but if my staff really need these values, then I have no doubt that this will continue to be a great place to both live and work. So thank you very much.
since Lewis left, we see no, 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 no new letters on our notice boards at all. Thank you. Okay. I will answer about your delays on 101 and then I'll leave it to you. Uh, there are serious problems about the fact that we have got the delays to be answered on 101 are too long. Uh, we have regular and frequent meetings with the Constabulary because I am very concerned about that. And they have now put forward, and it's been going on for, um, you know, for a long period of time. Um, we have we have to have a, a new computer system which hasn't helped. Um, but I am very conscious that the 101 is too long. Let me first sort of assure you that, that the, the answers to 999 they're still being answered within 10 seconds. So it's not affecting those. But the 101 is, is taking too long. Um, I'm getting together uh, in the next week or so with Assistant Chief Constable Nikki Watson about the improvement plan, about what we can do. Um, but there are some serious dilemmas in that if we look at the demand, that the number of people who are calling us, there are some, some who shouldn't be calling us. There are some, you know, we really don't need to be asked, you know, what they are being seen collected on the 101 number. We have, we have persistent callers who um, maybe can't get through to other services because other services are closed down at 4 or 5 o'clock and so they are calling us. Uh, we have those who, uh, a number who are, who are mentally ill, who, who just need some company and maybe their agency is not being able to, to, to provide that. So the Constabulary are doing a whole area of work to, 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 to look at reducing the number of people. Um, we also have to try to encourage people that where it is possible and where they have access is to, to send us an email. If you go uh, online, if you, if you go onto the Constabulary website and you can report to my crime and, and you can have access to, their, to that. Um, but, this is a big but, I'm very conscious that we're not doing very well on the 101 and I can assure you that it's something that we spend a lot of time continuing to talk about, finding different ways of how to improve it and we will continue to keep that under scrutiny until we have improved the service. Well, I think just to pick up two points around the point that we've touched on, I've touched on the mobile devices. Obviously that stops the people taking the 101 system and move directly on the got a question about that's the problem they're investigating. The student also raised the points around stupid questions you've got from the being asked. That's the point I'll do in terms of course scripts and exchange. We were on a previous system where I think it's quite formulated and it's going to just a really serious question. Because that's much more than just a description of the call and that's much more information as quickly as possible. So I don't see too much difference there. And in relation to the new text on notice boards, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because not everybody wants to see new text on notice boards, but I take the point, if it's helpful, Cycling charity. Uh, can I start by saying I've had several interactions with the police over the last few years, and the vast majority of them have been excellent. So praise the rich you. been mostly very good. Uh, but I have a question I brought up about two years ago. I think it was one of your first PCC meetings about uh, road safety. Road safety is rightly a priority. It obviously makes sense to prevent problems rather than that pick up the pieces afterwards. Uh, the police are consulted over most road schemes, certainly of any significance, uh, but the responses don't seem to recognise problems for cyclists, e.g. junction 16 of the M5 in South Gloucestershire, uh, which, is, which our, the local council has just made much more dangerous for cyclists and pedestrians. Your own officer uh, said he was only in uh, informally consulted and he didn't respond because he had no concerns about cycling around a motorway roundabout. Uh, to be honest, anybody who has no concerns about cycling around a four-lane motorway roundabout has no sense of self-preservation or no sense. Uh, but, 
um, as a cycle campaigner, we regularly respond to consultations from the council and we're regularly ignored. Uh, it would make a lot more sense if the police were actually able to respond in a positive manner. And I'm sure the councils would have great difficulty in uh, dismissing your views the same way they dismiss cyclists. Uh, the question is, why aren't you doing it? Um, I noticed from this document, it says under improving road safety for road users, you're now talking about improving road engineering. Is this in response to my question two years ago, to which I still don't have a response? Uh, I think I think we did have various responses. I mean, I've, I've, I've got a, a whole list of the, some of the responses that we did get. Uh, um, I think one of the things that the road scheme consultations are not a, a, a police issue. It's it's very much a uh, a, a authority and a highways issue. I think it's also important that we must make sure that when the police get involved, that they must be the evidence that if they make a review, it must be evidence based. Okay. Now, I had a conversation about it only this, uh, earlier on today with our lead on, on, on road safety. And so I asked the question that no doubt you will ask me, so are we waiting for someone to be killed? And um, I don't, I don't, I've, I've read it. Uh, and, and I think that it's, it's, it's not that so much, what it, it's not that at all. But it's, it's making sure that we, we look at road safety for, for cyclists, for pedestrians and, and, and for cars. And that particular roundabout, I think, is a scary roundabout. And I think we have some scary roundabout. I think it's probably a bit unfair, in my view, in personal view, to say that the British City Council ignore it. I think that's not... South Gloucester Council. OK. So, all right, South Gloucester. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I'm not so sure on, on that. I think one of the things that we've done as far as cyclists are concerned with the police is that we now have um, uh, um, uh, a near miss reporting where people can, uh, there's a lot of cyclists who wear the cameras uh, and for some of the cars who, who use as well, we, they now can send footage in regarding um, near misses. I think one of the things we haven't been very good at is analysing to see where there are accidents waiting to happen. And I know that they've, they've just started to, to put um, uh, uh, some an analysts to, to look at that area. But it's, it's, it's looking at the number of accidents. I think you quoted that accident, and I'm assuming it's, a, you know, forgive me if I'm wrong, something that there were six or there were either ten seven. in the last six or seven years. I think that's the figure you, you quoted. Um, and, and, and that is that is a growing amount of evidence. But we have to be, before the police give a view, we must make sure that it's evidence-based and not just an opinion. However, let me just be clear, as a police and crime commissioner, I can give you an opinion. So there are some things I can support cyclists, pedestrians and road users uh, as far as whether that as, 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 a, as a police and crime commissioner, whether I'm supportive of something that you want, but as a police, it, it, is, it is slightly it is different, and they must be, and they must have to, they must measure to see whether uh, there is evidence based. But I know that you're not going to be able to answer that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just think that it would actually save you money if the roads were designed safely in the first place, rather than having to continue to go along the straight up dead scientists writing reports and going to inquests. If it was what safe in the first place, you wouldn't have to do it that. I, 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 I'm, I'm sure if we could uh, engineer our roads and start from scratch again, we would certainly not be where we are now. But it is, it is uh, I suspect our roads were never built for the sheer volume of all our users than we are. That may be true, but as I said, that junction is just being made more dangerous for cyclists and pedestrians because the council ignored all representation from everybody. They just, we're going to go ahead and do it no matter what. The police have actually got in some representation to say, hang on a minute, this is actually making things dangerous. Then they wouldn't have been able to ignore it. Currently they ignore it. Everything anybody says they disagree with. The police, if the police could actually get involved and, and, and point out the fact that these things are dangerous, it would have much more effect than we're having at the moment. 
and you wouldn't have as much room to do scraping up dead bodies. I take your point. There was oh, sorry, just here. My question. Sorry, just wait for the mic. So you want to hear? My question, uh, I suspect, has a very quick answer. The question is. When cars are parked on the pavement, is it the responsibility of the police to do something about it? Yes or no? Yes and no. <laughs> um, as Sue said, I don't think our infrastructure in the city is quite built for the volume of the vehicles that we have here now. Um, but clearly, if a vehicle is parked in a way that's causing unnecessary destruction, then it can be taken towed by the police. I think we need to have some common sense of driving on some ways. So, if the vehicle is quite clearly got you, you know, I, I, I really want to see the push here many years ago with my children. You can't get past the end on the road to do that, and that's an unnecessary obstruction of someone visually impaired. That's a consequence, doesn't it, for the members of the community? There is no way that a, a disabled person or a person in a wheelchair or a person pushing a pram can pass along a pavement that I can quote to you. Right. Well, in, in which case, it's an unnecessary obstruction, and it should be reported to the file 101. Um, but it's a I reported it twice to the police. Right, OK. And um, 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 what happened? Nothing. Right. And as much as nothing, because by the time we got there, gone, because we spoke about prior no, 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 I continued to report it. Right, OK. I was going to say, because we don't know about it, so we can't deal with it. Sometimes there's a specific set of circumstances there, but again, I would urge you to go to neighbor forums or be serious and raise these things. This particular system. No, no, I, I am a member of a, a, of a watch group. In fact, I used to run one. But I have had no response of any kind from the police. Absolutely, speak often, keep the details, and can move into that. Thank you. One of the things that uh, is a really powerful way is coming to neighbor, either neighborhood um, forums. Uh, or in some other places, what we call pack meetings, because that's where uh, local communities can almost choose what they do. They, they choose the priorities that they want the police to focus on. And in three months' time, at the next meeting, police have to go back and actually say what they have, what they have done, uh, or if they haven't done anything, that's what they've got to say. So it's, it's really important that that message does get that does get a, a, across to to the police. Um, and whether that's through feet uh, surgeries, whether that's through um, mobile surgeries, whether that's through pack meetings, whether that's through neighbor forums. I think that the, that message is, is very clear that uh, your, your voice can be heard, but sometimes you do have to say it a bit louder. Yes, sir. Um, I think back to the, um, the Nick Gardner of Saka. According to Point West, the local TV uh, program, uh, the whole the whole issue is cost 572,000. As I understand, the chief constable earns 150,000. Surely he should pay some of that uh, 572 uh, out, out of out of his salary, seeing he hasn't done any work for a year, or or if not the whole lot, because to lose 572 out of a huge budget at a time of these cuts, I think is disgraceful. And also, why can't we know all, all, all his all, all his so-called alleged crimes and what he's supposed to have done? Okay. Um, well, certainly um, there is a lot of information on on, on our website. Uh, we had to redact quite a lot to make sure that witnesses were protected. Uh, that was really clear, and that was why some of the some of the uh, the, the so quite a lot of the, the redaction has been in order to make sure that we, we protect the, uh, the identity. As far as the, the payment of anything, the, he was treated very much as any officer was completely controlled by police regulations. Now, police regulations are, as I have said very clearly, have, it's taken far too long, been far too costly, um, and, and I think that the sheer fact that had it been held in public, which I believe it should have been done, uh, and argue that it, I, I argue that it should have been done, uh, I think that that would have helped the public to have understood. 
all cases of, of gross misconduct now are held in public. They are available for anyone to come and, uh, and, and see what's going on. Um, but this particular, as far as the start of this visit, it was before the time before the, the new law came into, into uh, interaction. But any now cases of gross misconduct are heard in public uh, up at um, Porter's Head, and if you're interested in, 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 in coming, then you, the, the details are put on, on the Sadbury's website, so, and you can just uh, come and attend. What about the pen shopping towards this? Oh, he, in, in, in police regulations, which are incredibly legalistic, um, and there is there is um, no mention that there is any payment. The investigation has to be paid from um, the public purse, and the uh, we have an independent investigation by the Independent Police Complaints Commission, which um, is something completely outside of Avon and Somerset. Um, because all chief constables have investigated. So this money is going to come out of the chief's budget? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. And that's why I try to be as public and, and tell everyone how much it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not a secret. So you have to say it's an incredible amount of money, isn't it? It was an incredible amount of money. Yeah. Certainly can't argue. Right. That, oh. Okay, well, this other mic's here, and then we'll come to you back. Sorry, I'm going to press you to the phone. Former Dunkirk Crystal resident, I'm interested in your view on what appears to be a move away from the uniform police service to civilian policing. Well, I mean, if we, we've got 2,700 police officers, we've got 2,000 police staff, and we have about 350 PCSOs. Um, if you're meaning to, if we have, um, okay, roughly, I'm not sure exactly, but. But the point is, it's making sure that we've got the right people with the right skills at the right time doing, doing the job. And there are some jobs in the past that we were using warranted officers for, things like child protection, or uh, I mean, we still use them, but uh, we, we, the civil, and I use the word civilian stuff, so and I'm not being derogatory in any way, I'm just making up the difference. That we need to make sure that it's the right people with the right skills. And some of the jobs don't need warranted officers to do. We will always need a number of warranted officers. That is, that, you know, I'm not going to argue with that. But there are many jobs that can be done by skilled staff that don't have to be police, police officers. And, and we are as, uh, roughly 50-50, say, between officers and staff. And we are one of the, uh, we're in the forefront in even the world of having m m more people who are not officers doing a lot of things to do so. I would say those functions are not kind of visible functions. And as much as you probably got to be able to reduce the number on that regard, but if they're doing investigative functions, you know, like things to be prisoners and building files, it does mean officers have powers of arrest, powers of search, obviously in pay, officers that you want to have and to use them in a different way. So those officers that are, are those the staff members that are involved in functions that are increasing their life, such as being as well, so it's not really what you need. So you're quite happy, it's, it's, a, it's the right way to go. Yeah, very much. Sorry, should we run this back here? Thank you. Um, so you mentioned about the pressure on cuts to funding and also the number of police officers to be used. Question for John really, what, what sort of things are you doing in the force to help protect the safety of the officers with the pressure to have fewer officers? Well, I think one of the things I spoke about was really putting together the response and the major response again into a little policing team. So they're working in the same ship pan, so officers on duty at the same time. Uh, in addition, we have moved our ship pan, so the more officers on duty later in the UK when it tends to be busier. So therefore, do we need the same number of stuff on duty at 7 o'clock in the morning to do 11 o'clock at night? No, we don't. So we really have to land it that way. But also, it seems about a much more of a one team approach. So once we have three operating bases in the main, one in South Bristol, one in North Bristol, one in East Central, but the Trinity Road, it's looking at the number of officers across the city rather than specific stations. So it'd be quite common for the inspectors who cover the three areas to speak every day, to identify the resources we have when we start around in that way. Similarly, we just introduced Taser, I'll say just probably 12 months ago, we introduced Taser, not to every member of staff, but to a number of officers in the city across the city. 
Whereas previously we were reliant on opposition to the firearms parks coming into the city when they used to use that. Um, and now a number of us are equipped with it, which means we can deploy more quickly, which is better for us to safety. And actually, what's particularly unpleasant is actually safer for the members of the public rather than potentially for our for example. And then, and then the last thing I spoke about the volleyball cameras. A number of us are very pleased to have those because obviously the fact that it's recorded all the time in other parts of the country, which is the escalation of violence, is actually the best place I've ever done. There's a number of things that we've seen in the time, but it's, it's actually paramount in my mind. You know, I was doing something for myself in Bristol. It's a, it's a tough job, you know, the officers that are out there doing a really fantastic job for the community, and we need to support them more than we can. Yeah, thank you. And I think also that we have. Um you know, we, we have a responsibility, obviously, as far as um, to our officers and to our staff regarding their um, mental health and making sure that there are services available to them 24 7 so that they do need some help that that is always available. And also to be a bit like mental health in, in all organisations, just being far more upfront that actually it, it can affect us all. Um, I mean, there's a statement that's, that's often found about that one in four of us are going to be affected with mental illness. Actually, I don't believe that. I think it's one in one because we all know people that we work with, we love, we care, who have been affected by that. And I think we all have a part to play, but there's nothing to be ashamed of. And that's something that I think maybe police in the past, I think, with, with, with uh, other organisations, maybe people didn't encourage people to come forward but uh, we are very clear that there's nothing to be ashamed of and it is we, in the same way that if you broke a leg, you wouldn't try and hide it. In the same way, we want to recognise that the, the, the pressures on being a police officer need help at certain times in their career. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, questions already about the, uh, the problems in our city uh, caused by the minority of people who choose to move around the city in, in motorcars and I'm afraid I'm going to raise this again. Uh, there are over two pedestrians and cyclists put in hospital in the central part of Bristol, that's the Bristol City Council area. Two pedestrians or cyclists put in hospital by motorists each week. Each week. It, it's carnage. Uh, it's like the um, the all two towers disaster happening every month in Bristol. People being put in hospital. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to hear Sue that you, you talked about evidence. Uh, and in your preamble, you referred to road safety, and you mentioned four facets of road safety. You mentioned the speeding cars. And you mentioned cycling on the pavement and you mentioned uh, cyclists going through red lights. Now, it concerns me that when it comes to evidence, cyclists on the pavement and cyclists going through red lights has got nothing to do with road safety. There are two pedestrians and cyclists being put in a hospital each week by motorists as a result just in the, in the centre of this stuff. And cyclists on pavement, whilst it, it's a serious nuisance, and cyclists going through red lights where it's annoying and it's a, it is a deep nuisance, has got nothing to do with the 100, well over 100 pedestrians and cyclists being put in hospital each week by motorists. And I'm concerned that at the forefront of your mind is this nuisance of pedestrians and uh, cyclists on, on pavement, cyclists next to red lights, when you're speaking about road safety. It, it's a nuisance. It's nothing to do with road safety, according to the evidence produced by a minister second Saturday. In your plan here, you talk about the fact that you are working to reduce the number of people killed and seriously injured on our roads by improving enforcement, education and road engineering. And I'd like to ask you if you could please say something more about what you are working to do, how you are achieving this, because it's a serious social evil in our city. And it seems to me that by repeatedly focusing upon uses, such as cyclists on pavements and cyclists going through red lights, the seriousness of the problem is being missed. 
You make a very good point. However, I would like to say that if you looked at my mailbag, what you consider a nuisance is not a nuisance. It's considered far more serious by people who are elderly, with people who are frightened to go out through their, through their, through their door. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that all cyclists are bad, or all cyclists are good, and, and vice versa on motorists. There does have to be. There are too many of us. And we do have to have a lot more tolerance. I, 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 I used um, an electric bike to go to a meeting with George Ferguson just to see what it was like on the roads. Um, and, and I felt a bit like a dinosaur, really, because I was still using hand signals. I think probably the cycling conditions and testing sort of reminded me of just what I could do. But I saw from, from, from the time that I came from the other side of the suspension bridge down into Temple Meads, I didn't see one other cyclist using uh, a hand signal. Now there has to be, there has to be, we, we, there has to be give and take. And we're going around and around about, so we have to work together. Many of us are motorists who are cyclists who are pedestrians. We're not a different beast as we, as we move into our different mode of transport. And there does have to be more tolerance. And if there were shed loads of money, I, I, I'm sure that many of us would argue that we would have completely segregated roads and paths, one for cyclists, one for motorists, and, you know, and, and, and one for pedestrians. I just don't think we will ever get to that point where we can afford to know a lot of our roads won't be able to. But as far as the consecutive are concerned, then you know, they, they will never have enough um, police officers to stop um, selfish motorists and selfish motorists. And what well, they will do is they will target certain days and certain operations in order to make sure that message is clear. Because at the end of the day, it has to be about education. It will never be about enforcement. There are just too many of us, and so and too few police. So in the same way as when the introduction of seatbelts were um, brought in, um, most of us said, well, we're never going to wear seatbelts for their students. In fact, most of us, particularly women, we had never excuse under the sun why we were never going to wear them. Uh, now we just do it. And, and I'm hoping, and of course it, uh, it is an aspiration, that there will be more tolerance when we get, because of the increasing number of cyclists, that they will that there will be there will be more care taken by motorists. But but it's not a matter of what we're doing policing. There will be a matter of education, it's a matter of then following that by enforcement. But actually we as a society have got to change the way that we treat other other roads. I'm very concerned that there's an element of fiction playing in what you have to say there. I hope you're not suggesting that there's a hundred people being put in hospital each week is acceptable because they don't use hand signals. If we were talking about sexual assault, and you were to suggest, and I'm sure you would not do this, that sexual assault happened because there were too many women wandering around our streets in short skirts, that would quite likely be a scandal. And I would suggest it to suggest that there were people being put in hospital because they don't use hand signals. No, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm trying, all I'm trying to say is that there, that we, misuse our roads. We all misuse the way we drive or we cycle or we walk. We're all guilty of that. You know, whether you're a pedestrian and you how many times you see and it's, it's not it's not being it's not being um, victim blame. It's the fact we just have to be aware that we are all sharing the same the same roads. Um, and you know it's 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 am I saying that uh, that uh, the, 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 the kids, or even you know, I'm just as bad as anyone else. Do I walk along the pavement, texting, or concentrating on the music I'm listening to? Probably. Do I am I paying attention to what's going on around me? Probably not. And the same thing with cyclists, and the same thing with motorists. We all have a responsibility. I'm not victim in any way, but I'm just saying we all have a responsibility. And I think that we have become very intolerant of anyone else on the roads, depending on whatever mode of transport we are using. But I think if I could just ask John oh, about that. It's a shared space, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And actually, it's one of the important of all of us to have some respect for each other. I don't think it's a black and white issue, and one particular part is to blame. Um, I can move the city itself, you know, in 20 miles out of the city council have introduced the, the large number of crossings there are. You know, a statistic I think I learned when I was in the BC is that the majority of the pedestrians are not down with 50 yards of crossing. So there is something underlay this in society where we've got to cut the corner and perhaps use the 
say the future is over there. But I do think this is around two million people using quite a small space. Actually, it's a sad day to bring up the space for the I think more attention needs to be paid to the evidence because your own statistics on Gloucester Road show that there is a particular group of early to speak lane. Seventy-eight percent of the incidents on Gloucester Road were caused by a motorist, and there were hardly any accidents or collisions or injuries caused as a result of the behaviour of cyclists. And I think, to be fair, there is some fixing going on here to suggest that all these injuries are happening because scientists and pedestrians are not using the shared space appropriately. It's just playing wrong and goes against the evidence. Okay, I mean, I could say to you, so what would you suggest? There are plenty of things to suggest. The Bristol City Council has recently published a document about road danger reduction. Mm -hmm. And the very title shows you that they're not talking about the roads being safe because the roads are not safe. 100 people a year they put in hospital. It's not the roads are not safe, it's that's the wrong uh, The Bristol City Council have also published uh, a cycling strategy for cyclists. There's nothing yet for pedestrians. There are many things that can be done. And we, um, you know, I, I have worked very closely. We had a, a road summit where we, where we, uh, those were, were discussed. And that was where one of the things that came up from some of the cyclist forums was to have this uh, collection of near misses so that we could, we could analyse that. So I, I'm, I'm certainly keen to look at, uh, at evidence and just say that we just can't keep on blaming everyone else and I think we all have responsibility. Mike, thank you. There's one thing I would like to go would like to um, talk about is that the question which was just requested about cyclists. I quite agree. One cyclist in a year who gets knocked out by a motor and killed is very, very sad and unfortunate. I would say that as a motorist, when I motor around, the number of cyclists who do not wear high vis jackets, and the same applies to motorcyclists in the same way. Um, if they wore a high vis jacket, they would have much greater chance of being seen by a motorist. There are some motorists I know who are careless and don't look at what they're doing. But, you know, I would say to you, sir. The evidence says that's not true, sir. You're speaking from ignorance. Uh, I'm sorry? The evidence says the work of fame is not true. You are speaking from ignorance. Okay, okay, well, all right. I'm not going to argue no, about it. No, I'm no, just saying, wear a high vis jacket. You've got a much greater chance of being seen, and the same for a motorcyclist. If you go to see a, boat, a police motorcyclist without a high vis jacket, and if you go careful, I'm always looking for boat for cyclists because it's important I don't knock them down. And certainly, if they do cross over a red light and knock down me as a pedestrian, then they are in the wrong as well. So it works both ways. There is, there is, um, you know, we do have to be tolerant um, and just being aware that we're never going to be able to ban any group. We're never going to be able to ban motorists, we're never going to be able to ban cyclists, we're never going to be able to ban pedestrians. We all have to have live in a shared space. And we've just got to find a way to be able to look after each other during, you know, when we are out on the roads. I think it comes down to actually respect. If you respect another person and not just respect yourself, mm -hmm. then you're more likely to care for other people. I think harm happens when people don't care about other people, and evil happens when people don't care about other people. So if every respects one another and tries to live tolerantly, then harm will be reduced across society. Okay. okay. Sure. Uh, before I come to you, is there anyone else who hasn't asked a question that wants to ask one before I come back to you? Sure. So, um, I'd like to say, man, that uh, being a resident of Bristol and um, travelling throughout the centre of Bristol on a number of occasions, quite a number of uh, cyclists driving to swipe the bike lane with their hands not listening to the music. This they sort of tends to call to pay for all that, but it's called to pay for the safety. Sorry, I think it's a song. Maybe you have to hold it nearer to your mouth. Right. 
Is that okay? Yeah. Is it better? Yeah, ha having been a, a, a resident of Bristol and driving through the central Bristol or anywhere in the Bristol area, I find that the cycles of wearing earphones and listening to music as opposed to concentrating on the safety of the road. And that's all I've got to say. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Stuart, is there, is there a question that you wanted to ask them? Uh, I agree with the gentleman behind me. Um, I see cyclists going down both uh, pavements on Park Street, going on the pavement where pedestrians are allowed, and they go, they go right past the bus stop, etc. And they also cycle down Watershed. And for me, Watershed, where the information bureau is, is only for pedestrians, not cyclists. And, uh, and also, I want to praise the police this time. Um, Sergeant Bell, 3741, who's a member of the LGBT team. Yes. Um, he got um, the control centre to tell people what LGBT stands for. Uh, beforehand, when LGBT community rang up, people in the control centre didn't know what it stood for. So therefore, the community put the phones down, but they were appalled that the police didn't know what it stood for. Now, now since Sergeant Bell, but if they're now, it's noticed up in the control centre, everybody knows what it stands for. So I have to play Stephen Bell for that. I'll make sure I do that actually if you're Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Are, are there any more questions that anyone wants to ask? Sorry, it's just a On a bit more of a, a more serious note, one of the points in the slide about the number of missing people get reported per day. Um, was it 10 or 10? 10. 10, yeah, 60, yeah. So there's, there's that. Um, I'm also particularly concerned about uh, child safety as well. Well, safety in general, but you know, people could be missing or people could be harmed. Um, I just want to wonder what sort of numbers are we actually talking about in, across, the, across the whole region, not just Bristol. I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't know the numbers across our region. I do. Um, as far as missing persons are concerned, the number for last year was 2,139, which is a 33% increase year on year. Um, um, child protection crimes, there's an additional 7,000 crimes, which is a 25% increase. Yeah, circle uh, in, in Bristol, I think it was, and in fact it got on a bus and couldn't work out how to get off. So of course the member of the family went with a police officer and got off the bus, so it worked, it worked really nice. Well. I also wonder, <coughs> in terms of um, exhausting these costs, um, how much money across the region it is spent trying to actually recover people who are lost or missing or whatever. I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do, it's obviously a very good thing to try and recover people who obviously at risk of severe harm, um, but in just in terms of how much it normally costs for an average case. I'm afraid, I'm afraid I don't know that. Right. And, and the case is very massively from a few hours to several days, sometimes several months. Yeah. Um, for me, it's the same in case you really investigate that. Actually, we the best agency to, to find something. Yeah. Um, to, to remember a different way that you don't know what value you can find actual transactions and sources. Yeah. But I think it's interesting to think about how the nature of our business. Changes all the streets look like foreign incidents. 
Yeah, or involving show kind of crimes. So one of the other instances of Kevin is it's part of the issue and um, perhaps other services have got the capacity and such forms of police again. Um, so we see more and more people who are, as I said, who are vulnerable and then have to turn to a place of safety and we call that one. Um, because it's not just a police enforcement, it's working out how we're going to make our roads safer for everybody. Um, not just police-led, it's going to, it's going to have to be working with other agencies. Uh, I think the open space is not necessarily that particular junction or that particular scheme. We need to have other parts of the country or even more globally about where things are going well. And we'll also be introducing that. So I know whilst it was absolutely negative, the water outside of the lane and then introduced well, in that case, Junction 16 should be closed down immediately. Okay, but, well, again, it's really difficult for me to comment. Yeah, that's but, but there was a very recent case of a girl, Summer Sanctuary, who fell off uh, on a shared use path into the path of a car off a bicycle and was run over. That's exactly what's going to happen at Junction 16 because of the way it's being designed. Uh, but the police, again, have raised no concerns. I find it very... I think, I think there, were, there were concerns if we go back to that particular well, incident. I mean, that's, uh, that's in not North what Somerset, the officers told me. It was in North Somerset, was it, in Western, yeah. that particular incident. Yeah. And I know that they are now um, doing some work to roads and also reducing the speed limit. Too little, too late. Yeah. Junction 16, your officer should have raised these points at the time. I did, I was ignored. If, if, if you really want to improve road safety, you've got to engage before these schemes, well, as these schemes are being designed, not afterwards. It's too late afterwards, you can't be right. And I, think, and I think you're right, one of the things that, um, because we have a, a number of people who want certain um, speed limits reduced, and one of the things I discussed in today's meeting was to making sure that there is a uh, an easily understood process about how and when the police can get involved. Uh, and, I, and I hope that that will go up on our website within the next month or so, so that people can understand what they can do in order to work with highways in order to try to persuade the, the highways agencies to uh, reduce their speed limit. But that's the, the, the speed limit is, is, is not led by the police. Do your officers actually have uh, I know they go to road accidents and they, you know, they, they have a distressing uh, task of sorting the accident out and helping people. But do your officers actually have experience in making roads safe, which is not the same as accident investigation necessarily? If they, if they don't understand how to make roads safe, how are they going to improve road engineering? Charles, 
Um, I saw an article in the Metro recently where um, a, a young woman um, had sex with a, a young boy at the age of 13, I think, and I, and I believe he, so she was given a suspended sentence. If that was a man, that would be very unlikely, I just thought. And again, the other thing I was going to say, I know that's the justice, not the place. I know, I know. Yeah. Um, but I also think that I have actually tried to challenge that, that um, sentence, and it's actually quite hard in the Justice Department to actually get through to any particular line to actually speak to anyone, because if you just get a voicemail, you don't actually get anyone to speak to. <laughs> um, and my, my interest are in, in helping prevent children especially being harmed, but other people being harmed as well. Um, and, you know, in terms of the number of incidents we were talking about earlier on, the, the, both the volume and the rate of increase is, is, is significant. And, and, I, and not only that, um, in, terms, in terms of societal attitudes, um, and we know a lot about um, racism um, being a crime. In fact, in fact racism, making racist comments is a crime. Um, but if you actually talk about paedophilia um, in the workplace or anywhere else and make jokes about it, um, that seems to be acceptable, when in reality it's actually about a child being harmed, raped or molested. Um, that shouldn't be something to be joked about. And I think if people are making jokes like that, it, it, a, it has two effects. One is to normalise the behaviour and for other people to potentially go down that road and become potential offenders in that direction. Um, but also um, that you're... Um, sorry, I forgot my train of thought. <laughs> Um, yeah, you just, you just, there's just additional harm, and I know racist comments aren't very nice, and there's a history with racism, etc. But when a child's life gets destroyed, and an adult's life potentially gets destroyed, and ultimately you get loads and loads of suicides, is that acceptable in today's society? Okay, I, mean, I have to say I, I've never heard people joke about child abuse. I have. Um, and, uh, and as far as the, you know, Sean, Sean said, as far as regarding the judiciary, it is always very clear whether it's about child abuse or it's about anything. But the judiciary is always very, it has to be very separate from the police. Yeah. If we start muddying the waters and making the police judge and jury, actually we then live in a police state. So there has to be, I'm not talking about particular issue, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm very clear that there has to be a very strict division between the police making yeah. a very good a, a, a file that's got evidence and it, taking it to the, to the court where it's then taken by the CPS and it's then very separate from, from, from what, the, what the police do. And it's really important for the way our society manages people who, uh, who do bad things or whatever, that we always keep the judiciary very distinct. Yeah. From from the police and um, and we all may criticise the judiciary. It's easy to, sometimes. I'd be a magistrate, and I know sometimes you know, that there has been uh, criticism. But all I can say is, if you go to court and you watch a case from the very beginning to the very end, you are far more informed than you are from reading the media. Yeah, that's no, all I, I understand, that's all I I understand that what, what I'm talking about is really <coughs> in the context of. Uh, I go to a club in Bristol World and I've had been one recently a post on the wall saying if you have racist comments, report to Dave in some set of place. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. But if a child, if you make a comment about pedophilia, which could potentially destroy a whole child's life and an adult's life as well, um, that seems to be okay. I'll say it's not okay. Um, Okay, is there anyone else? Okay, just a I'm just wondering, obviously there's some of the budget cuts and the trust to the vulnerable in society. Just wondering how that might be impacting on addressing serious and organised crime in the region and terrorism. I 
I'm also thinking about a bit of cybercrime as well with your recent uh, talk talk lots of data. Well, I mean, I mean there is, um, we, we are part of a police service that has to um, make sure that we have to comply with what's called a strategic policing requirement. And there always has to make sure that uh, there, is, um, there is funding for organised crime groups. But I, I think a lot of that is, particularly, is making sure that we don't, keep, we don't look at too much of our boundaries. So working within regional forces, working within alliances, uh, to recognise that we can join our, our forces together in order to be able to tackle um, some of these far more serious crimes. As far as counter-terrorism is concerned, that is a separate budget that is funded direct from the government that doesn't, although it may come into the constabulary, it, it can't be its free Okay. Okay, all right, well, thank you all very much indeed. Uh, and I hope that you found it interesting, I certainly have. Uh, and I very much appreciate you giving your, your evening up to come and listen to John and myself. And I hope you've, uh, you've, you've learned a lot from some of the questions that we've been asked. So thank you. Thank you very much.